I don't want I want that all hidden. I want I don't want the sound systems hidden. I want all you basically when you walk into the space is you're seeing these beautiful images of sound waves. But you're you're in this in the presence of all this dynamic sound that's happening and then I, I guess I wanted to I want to create an opportunity for people to have an intimate relationship or an opportunity to have an intimate moment with the sound and, and make that connection like wow, all around us or if, if we if we if we see sound as, as illustrated by you know what these drawings show, all these waves are existing around us all the time. It's all invisible, and I, I guess I'm trying to bring the invisible visible and get people thinking about you know what sound is and how it permeates everywhere we go, everything we do, all day, every day. It's just imagine the the intricacies of what those patterns look like. So in this first series, I'm trying to I'm basically starting with. Uh, very basic pure tones of that and trying to illustrate that. Um. MacBook Pro with the spinning thing just trying to bring it. <laughs> That's pretty bizarre. <coughs> anyway, it's not that necessary for I guess you to see this thing as this just crashed my Mac. Um, <laughs> we'll move on. I'll just, I'll just basically put the screensaver up and it'll just kind of flow through a whole bunch of the different images. Um, so now let's, I guess, I, I would really, uh, I'd really like to turn the floor over to Scott a little bit and, and, and because I know all you geeky types here probably want to know a little bit more about how we made these and, and what, what's actually happening with the circuit. Am I guessing? I would assume you guys kind of want to dig into that a little bit. And I mean, I, I have a fairly basic understanding of how this all works and it's been a wonderful process for me to watch how this all comes together. And, and I was, the whole time I was like, when can I solder something? You know, <laughs> when can I drill something? And he's just like, oh, because you know you could really fuck this up quick, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know. So, but, <laughs> but I was like, no, no. But I used to work for Axe Music, and we used to solder, and make, make, you know, lots of cables, and I used to do all that. But that was like 20 years ago, and I think I have the skills still. And I had to kind of prove myself to him, though. Like, and he was like, yeah, that's pretty good. So, I, yeah, he did the. I have to say, the mass majority of um, the actual critical soldering and stuff. But I actually soldered some. I did quite a few too. I'm proud of that. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it started with, uh, you know, we basically, you know, the first prototype that we had was like a point to point wire piece and he was just like, man, we have to build 12 of these and it would just be insane amount of work to actually, you know, so be, you're basically soldering to, uh, top and bottom every point to point. So he was like, you know, there's a process of uh, DIY hand etched uh, boards that a lot of people have made. And Scott hadn't actually tried that before in his practice, uh, and I'm delighted because um, along the way, 
uh, I really felt that really good about um, you know working with somebody that this was actually helping him to try new stuff that would further his stuff because he actually builds these marvelous handmade analog uh, synthesizer instruments and stuff like that and, and I think he, he said he'd always wanted to try the hand etching technique and see if we could, you know, see if we could get that working because it would really save us a lot of work in, in, at the end of the day. And we, yeah, we figured it out. Um, and I became the guy that was like ironing these things onto the PC boards for 15 minutes and getting all, you know. And then we used uh, acetone and uh, isopropyl alcohol um, and lots of hand scraping, and we ended up. Yeah, they work, man. They're amazing. So, Scott, uh, maybe you could uh, maybe describe a little bit about the process of how the circuit's working. Yeah, sure. I'll do, I'll do it real quick. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and it might be more interesting for people to ask questions. Uh, we can pass this around. But so, yeah, I'd never etched a circuit board before. I didn't want to get into the chemicals, the hydrochloric acid, and the uh, hydrogen peroxide, but, but we did it, and I, it was it was good for me to get over my fear of the chemicals, because <laughs> it turned out to not be such a big deal. But so we made twelve of these things, and initially, um, you know, I'm I'm someone who's pretty much a hack at this at this stuff. I'm I'm uh, I'm not somebody who is doing things with electricity and knows what they're doing with electricity uh, some of the time. Well, some of the time. He fooled me pretty well. Uh, pretty much. Uh, so yeah, yeah. So I'm like, wow, a sign. He wants a perfect sign tone. And I had been experimenting with the Arduino with a, the Atmel 328 processor, um, using it to, to, to make sounds. Um, uh, but of course, it can only make square waves. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a digital processor, has digital I.O. Um, there's no analog anything on, it, on Arduino, really. So um, uh, doing, doing a sine wave was something that I, you know, I had no clue how we were going to do that. Of course, the internet exists for that kind of stuff, right? So yeah. I found that there were a number of people who were experimenting with various ways of creating um, not only wave, not only sine waves, but granular synthesis and all kinds of direct digital synthesis methods uh, using pulse width modulation, which totally made sense to me. So I started experimenting, and we figured out how to use one of the pins to generate uh, a sine wave. I just have a, a table uh, in memory of 256 points of the sine wave, um, and it just reads through that. Um, and I'm using an interrupt uh, timer uh, to sort of make sure that while the the, the Atmel processor is, in the, is is also looking at the uh, the prox sensor and it's doing all kinds of other work, but I needed to make sure that that sine wave was not going to be interrupted. And so the only way to do that was the clock interrupt um, routine that I sort of hacked together and figured out how to do. Um, so one pin is doing that, and it's very, very accurate. And, and we were able to get really, really accurate sine wave frequencies. Uh, we built a little, uh, a little filter to get rid of the, uh, the actual fundamental frequency of the square wave. And actually, in building that filter, I found myself sort of intuitively replacing caps with different size caps just because it sounded better. It was just one of those intuitive processes. We came up with something that works really nicely. Um, and uh, the, so the only thing, that's really all this thing does. We've got a prox sensor, it reads the, the sonar sensor, uh, and then uh, it uses an opto isolator to actually modulate the volume. That, that turned out to be the trickiest part, was actually modulating the volume of the output of that square wave. Um, so I just use an opto isolator, which I described in the video uh, I came up with. And I also ended up reading a pattern uh, uh, that sort of smoothed that process out a little bit um, in the code. So I'll just pass this around. Um, yeah, that's, that's. If you guys have any questions about that, we maybe we should just ask him right now. Like, uh, or ask him. Because <laughs> I mean, this is the thing. Like, the, he did a lot of. I mean, there's a lot of technology involved in this project, right? Not just the, not just this. The, the wave driver, uh, and just all of the product. Like, the beautiful images. I mean, it, it's it's this amazing amount of. Yeah, it was fun. It's two years, and uh, January 14th, a lot of T53. Yeah. What's going on? I have a less technical question, um, but in having this 180-something prints that you had to choose from, I mean, why did you choose 12 um, of all the numbers? Uh, I think uh, I was sort of all, kind of referencing loosely 12-tone music, <laughs> and I just 
like just almost like a nod to that, mm -hmm. kind of cheeky in a way, almost. Yeah. 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 That's that's sort of, and I just I thought like even like visually in a room, three on a wall, like it just and realistically, I mean the cost in setting up this installation is it's actually been a lot of money to get, and so I mean the. That's going to be offset because I'm actually selling the prints as well. Um, and so there's actually 24 prints that I've chosen for the first release. Um, they're all limited editions of five. And, um, and I've been fortunate enough to have a curator and investor come in and basically bought a whole, the whole first edition off me. And that's what basically gave me the money to continue funding and, and uh, you know, hire Scott and basically pay for all, you know, everything. My studio, um, all the all the speakers, the prints themselves are you know it's almost costing almost fourteen thousand dollars just to get the prints all mounted and, and, and shipped here from Toronto. Um, but I don't know. I've been really fortunate because I haven't. I, I really haven't been. In, I haven't had to compromise at all on this, this project. And as an artist, like that's a rare freaking thing. That, like I can tell you right now from my experience, I've been doing this a long time, and. Uh, Boy, it's you know this this might also this might sound kind of weird to you, but I almost feel like I've been handed a gift this idea, and uh, just because every all the whole course of the, from the from the, I'll just, you know I'll just be honest with you from the beginning from literally going to Bath and over coffee yeah I got this idea oh come do research in Bath oh okay and then I'm there and, and then you know I. And then literally when I brought these images and I'd invite you to come up and like flip through my portfolio here and uh, take a look at them. Um, you know, I bring them back and I show them to an art collector here and he just fell in love with them and, uh, and immediately just said, you know, he said, I, I don't think you're going to get your, your Canada Council grant. I think this is, this is, they're just not going to respond to this for some, for some weird reason. But that doesn't matter because I'm buying the first edition, and that'll give you enough money to, to make the project happen. And uh, and that's the only, really, honestly, the only way that I could have continued <coughs> after like literally getting the prints into my computer. I mean, that that was that was expensive enough. I mean, it was my own personal investment in the in the modular synthesizer and building all the the the, the wave driver instruments and all the speakers I blew up and. Just you know, extra travel to Banff, all that kind of stuff was really expensive, um, and I kind of, I almost kind of you know capped what I could personally invest into it, and then all of a sudden, right when it needed to, this other support came in, and then I'm like, all right, so then I get my studio downtown, I get the 12 channel system set up, and then I start that that phase of actually you know working on the musical aspect of it. And then the whole next phase came with, uh, you know, figuring out the technology and, and then, and ironically, me and Scott met a year ago and we share, you know, a lot of, we're, you know, we really like a lot of the same music and we're, we, we're both working in experimental sound and have been for years and I think both, you know, really like what each other works on and, and produces and, and, then, uh, and then I saw these instruments that he makes and I'm just like, shit, do you know Arduino? And he goes, yeah, and I'm like, hey. I've got an idea. Do you think you could build this 